morning. My name is Jack Lavin, President and CEO of the Chicago and Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us this morning. Although I wish we were here to discuss proactive ways to grow our economy and support job creation across Chicago, rather than what we will be what will be the most expensive and complicated form of paid leave required in the country. The ordinance passed on November 9th and goes into effect in a few short weeks, December 31st. I want to say this is the highest attendance uh, of a webinar that we've had uh, since COVID-19. Uh, that tells you how important this topic uh, is. Before I begin, I want to extend my gratitude and thanks to our members and businesses throughout Chicago who helped in the paid leave fight that came to a head just three weeks ago. Whether it was making calls to your city council member or providing feedback to our team during the negotiations, your support and partnership was critical in mitigating the impact of this ordinance to Chicago's job creators. I also want to thank our government relations team, Brad Teets and Ramiro Hernandez, for pulling together this morning's webinar, but more importantly, for their leadership and work in recent weeks on this paid leave issue and keeping our business coalition together. I want to thank them especially for all their leadership. I will let Brad and Ramiro get into the specifics here shortly. I want to briefly say that we cannot underestimate how challenging of a political and legislative environment we find ourselves in at the city of Chicago level. In a few short weeks, city council passed the most expensive and complicated form of paid leave in the country, an ordinance to eliminate the tipped credit, which will have a harmful effect on our restaurants, bars, and hospitality industry, and a resolution to put on the March 2024 primary ballot a referendum to quadruple Chicago's real estate transfer tax. The speed at which this has happened has shocked many. On any given vote, the roll call to pass anti-business and anti-growth legislation already starts at 20 to 20, 21 to 22 yes votes, and you only need 26 votes to pass something at council. Given this climate, it is all the more important that the business community, small, medium, and large, sticks together. I think we learned during the paid leave negotiations that we are stronger when we all work together. The chamber led a coalition of more than 15 business, or business organizations from our partners in the trade associations <clears throat> to local chambers from across the city. And that unity, presence and voice allowed us to secure many important concessions during our negotiations, despite how concerning the final product remains. The strength of our coalition put the proponents back on their heels. But we also know that there is more to come. We don't know what yet, but these activists and labor unions simply will just move on to the next big thing, whether it's burdensome new regulations not tried anywhere else in the country or new taxes. It is coming. As we move forward, we will be growing our coalition of industry groups, local chambers, and any other businesses willing to join these legislative fights but we'll need your help. We intend to introduce ordinances that actually address the challenges Chicago businesses are facing, be it crime, lawsuit reform, or access to capital. We ask that you spread the word, activate your colleagues, other business leaders, as well as employees that are concerned about these harmful policies, and work with us as we try to ensure a safer, more equitable, and more prosperous Chicago. Thank you again for joining us this morning. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brad Teets, our Vice President of Government Relations and Strategy. Thank you for being here this morning. Brad, over to you. Great, thanks, Jack, and uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, quick agenda. So I'll be speaking to um, the timeline, um, the process by which this how played out, by how which this all played out. And then um, some of the uh, the the, the uh, big uh, finer points to what what did pass on November 19th. Um, after that, my colleague Ramiro Hernandez uh, will be um, speaking directly to what's in the ordinance um, and doing a detailed walkthrough. And then finally, um, there will be uh, 15 to 20 minutes at the end of this presentation um, for for a robust Q and A. Uh, if we don't use the full hour, um, you know, we'll, we're happy to give you your 20 minutes back, but uh, we do want to allot some time for questions. And um, if you are able to insert your questions into the chat function, 
Uh, we are gathering those and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. A couple other um, housekeeping items. Uh, one, um, you know, today's presentation does not constitute legal guidance. We have to say that as a, as a disclaimer here. Um, but given um, the time sensitive nature of this um, and the fact that um, the department has yet to um, it, um, put out their rules for public comment, uh, we did want to, um, um, you know, provide a forum for folks to ask questions and for us to kind of present, um, you know, what our, our perspective was on the ordinance. Um, uh, the webinar is being recorded and will, will, will be placed on our website. Um, so if you have to uh, hop off early, it will be there um, for, for further uh, listening in. And uh, we will share the slides at the end of this presentation. So, um, you know, just wanted to make you aware of that as well. But uh, with that, um, we'll get into um, the presentation. So if you could skip to the next slide here. So uh, really quick, we wanted to run through the timeline um, uh, before we get into the substance, uh, because the timeline was important. So you're all familiar with what happened um, uh, a little less than a year ago at the state of Illinois, where the Paid Leave for All Workers Act um, was put into effect. And Governor Pritzker signed that into law in March of 2023. Um, groups like our organization um, and other business groups helped negotiate um, the state paid leave law. And... Um, from our perspective, and we all went neutral on it, it did strike that that careful balance that needs to be struck on paid leave policy, which, as I've been saying throughout this um, these negotiations, it's complicated. It's more than just the number of days. Um, but part of part of what that law did was exempt um, municipalities who have existing paid sick leave laws in place, like the city uh, Chicago City Council and like Cook County. Um, any changes after January 1, the effective date of the Paid Leave for All Workers Act, um, if a municipality changes their paid sick leave law, they have to at least meet the standards um, of, of what the state just put into effect. Um, so that was the, the, the basis for uh, labor. Um, they, they, did not, um, they did not want there to be a situation where uh, Chicago workers, because um, a paid sick leave, a paid sick leave day is a lesser benefit than a PTO day. Um, from their perspective, they didn't want Chicago workers to have a lesser benefit than the re than the rest of the state. Um, you know, having said that, um, they they could have passed something. They could have passed the exact same ordinance they passed um, just a few weeks ago after January one, because almost every part of that um, ordinance does exceed uh, what the state did. Um, and they could have gotten the language a whole lot cleaner and uh, we could have secured a lot of other important uh, legal and financial protections. But nevertheless, um, we are where we are. And on the right side of the screen, uh, you can see kind of the timeline for what transpired with this ordinance. Um, a 15 plus day P uh, PTO ordinance was introduced in July. Groups like ours uh, reached out um, to Chairperson Rodriguez uh, and labor and others in late July, early August, and asked for meetings. Uh, we were told that negotiating meetings would convene when they were prepared to do so. Um, that first meeting um, at their request did not occur until October 13th. And then as you can see on the screen here, uh, the ordinance finally passed on November 9th. So in less than four weeks, um, uh, the city council passed the most complicated and expensive form of paid leave in the country. Um, and, and I should add, in between October 13th and November 9th, our organization and, and like Jack said, 13 or 14 other groups were at the table with labor, et cetera, and, uh, and Chairperson Rodriguez. And, and uh, we were able to secure uh, a number of concessions, but um, the ordinance still goes too far too quickly. And uh, that is ultimately why our organization and others um, uh, remained opposed to the ordinance. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide here. So getting into the, the meat of, of what passed on November 9th, um, you'll see on your screen here um, a pretty detailed chart. So, um, and I'm just gonna quickly walk through it and add some, add some context. So um, starting on December 31st of 2023, um, every employer, so um, big, small, um, nonprofit, for-profit will have to award uh, a minimum of uh, 10 uh, paid leave days. So as you can see here on the screen, um, five paid sick leave days and five uh, PTO days as a bare minimum. This applies to any worker who works in a two week period in a uh, or two a uh, two hour period or two weeks. I'm sorry, two hours within a two week period in the city of Chicago um, during the year. So 
uh, we've actually, um, there are a lot of companies now who are, are worried about what this might mean for workers who, who just travel, um, you know, throughout or through Chicago to get to another uh, location, maybe somewhere in the suburbs. Uh, the travel industry now is is closely watching this to understand its impact, but um, the the broad nature of that definition in and of itself is very concerning. Um, there are a few exceptions to um, the employee, covered employee elected officials, railroad uh, railroad workers, and then the construction industry. Um, there are a number of um, you know uh, city exempt <laughs> city exemptions because. Uh, apparently, what's good for private sector workers is not is not um, sufficient for the public sector. But um, I digress. Uh, but city um, seasonal workers, OEM, OEMC workers, um, thankfully, interns um, are exempted, both pr public and private, uh, and the list goes on. But so um, again, ten days, and then at, at an accrual rate of one hour for every thirty five hours worked, and that's capped at 40, uh, 40 hours. So. If you recall, the state law is actually at um, uh, one hour for every 40 hours work. So it's a bit of a faster accrual rate, but um, they actually had proposed one hour for every 15 hours worked initially, uh, which would have been the most aggressive in the country by far. So 35 hours is within kind of where other cities and states are that have similar laws on the books. Um, on the usage, so when you can actually use the leave, uh, for the paid sick leave, um, a worker has to um, have worked at uh, with an employer for at least 30 days, um, and then on the PTO side uh, for at least 90 days. The state law is at 90 days. Um, the current Chicago paid sick leave ordinance, however, is at 120 days, so that is a significant ramp up. Um, on, on usage of time, and this was another part of our negotiations, um, on paid sick leave, uh, um, you can use the leave in two-hour increments and um, uh, four hour increments on the paid leave time. Uh, another important piece to this is, is the notice and documentation. So throughout our negotiations, it was, um, you know, I, 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 having been a part of the state negotiations and then coming to the city, there is a careful balance that the more days that you increase for, for paid leave, um, the, the more uh, control that you want the employer to have over use of those days. Uh, five days was a low enough number to strike that balance, but I think anything higher than that, the employer needs to have a little more control over when those days can be used. So on, on the paid sick leave, um, there is uh, the employee um, simply needs to give notice uh, seven days out if foreseeable, uh, if not foreseeable, um, just a, a text or, you know, an email in the morning, the morning of before they tend to take the day off. Um, documentation, a doctor's note, for instance, is requested or is required after the third consecutive day. On the PTO side, um, there does not need to be any documentation, but the employer does have full pre-approval um, uh, for when days can, can and cannot be used. And then um, another important piece of this, and we've heard from a lot of local chambers who are concerned about this, on the paid sick time, uh, there is a 10-day a annual rollover or 80 hours every year. So at any given point, um, and if, if the if the employer or the employee is going to have five paid sick leave days, if they roll over 10 and haven't used any, uh, they could have upwards of uh, 15 days, 15 paid sick leave days. On the PTO side, um, if the, the PTO days are front loaded, so awarded at the beginning of the benefit period, uh, no rollover is required. However, if uh, the PTO is, is not front loaded, uh, the worker can carry over two days um, annually. So that was another, um, uh, you know, piece of our negotiations as well. All like this chart that was before you was kind of the basis for our negotiations. And as you can kind of see, you know, if, if you move certain pieces around, uh, it has an impact on another. So this is the first half. And um, Han, if you're able to move on to the next slide here. So to continue with um, kind of what the broader framework was, another significant piece of our opposition related to um, the payout. So when an employee is separated from an employee, either through termination, resignation, what have you, um, but nowhere else in the country are we aware of that uh, requires payout um, via legislation like this. So uh, there is no um, payout required at paid sick leave time. However, through our negotiations, uh, we were dead set against payout um, but fortunately, there were a number of small business 
um, uh, small business in the room with us uh, saying this would this would cripple them. So uh, what ultimately came to pass was a, a three tiered system. So businesses with 50 or less employees are not subject to the payout requirements. They are still subject, however, to the rest of the ordinance. So it's not a full small business carve out um, like some have proclaimed. Um, Mid-sized businesses, if you will, um, according to the ordinance. Uh, so those with 51 to 100 employees, um, they are um, exempt from the payout requirements uh, for the first year, but then it's, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's triggered in, in year two here in 2025. And then any business with 100 or and 101 101 or more employees is subject to uh, to the paid leave, um, to the payout requirement. So um, you'll see on the screen here at most, what that means is seven days or 56 hours. That is because um, in the um, most extreme scenario where an employer front loads five PTO days and the employee has carried over uh, two from the previous year, um, that's the max that can be paid out and the max amount of PTO days that a worker would have at any given point. Um, union contracts, so while um, proponents pro uh, proclaimed it to be a, a full uh, exemption, that is not the case. Um, simply under what passed, um, the, the, the requirements can be waived. Um, so existing CBAs are grandfathered in. Once that CBA expires, um, the, these provisions can be waived in lieu of a separate um, uh, floor, if you will, but uh, no, it's not a full carve out for union contracts. Uh, this is being enforced by the Office of Labor Standards under um, the Business Affairs and Consumer Prote uh, Protection Department. Uh, the fines that you'll see on the screen, uh, there were some uh, minor changes that were made to this. Earlier versions had uh, the fines at 2,500 um, flat. Uh, this, this gives a little more leeway for the department to ascertain um, how severe the violation was. And then another significant piece of our opposition uh, is always going to be the private right of action as we see um, these, you know, being weaponized more and more by the trial bar. Um, and so the, the paid sick leave ordinance um, on the paid sick leave time, the, the private right of action is, is um, in effect starting December 31. And labor's reasoning behind that is every Chicago employer is already having to comply with uh, the Chicago Paid Sick Leave Ordinance, uh, there should be no um, material change in implementation or operations from their perspective there. Um, on the PTO side, um, uh, what, what is often stated is, is there is a delay um, for one year of um, private uh, right of action um, penalties. And uh, that is also not the case. Um, the way that the, uh, the current language is written um, an employer could still get sued for an infraction that happens in 2024. That lawsuit can just not be filed until after 2025. So uh, we have made um, the city and other stakeholders aware of that and are hopeful for additional changes. But um, the private right of action, something that we were pushing to, for throughout our negotiations was uh, what's called a notice and cure process. So um, an employer is made aware by the employee of an alleged violation they have a set number of days to uh, correct or cure that violation uh, before a lawsuit can be filed. So we're actually hopeful, and I'll explain more here in a second for a trailer ordinance on that front. Uh, next slide, please. So here uh, we just wanted to um, demonstrate um, how how expansive the uh, Chicago ordinance is. Um, you know, if you're looking, uh, only West Hollywood has days. Uh, a much smaller city, um, you know, keep in mind as well. Uh, so they're at 12, the city's at now, um, Chicago will be at 10, but, and you'll see um, in that third column, um, most cities and states only do it for paid sick leave. So again, you know, this is a completely untested and new model of paid leave um, that the city is gonna be forcing upon every business here in the next uh, four weeks now without rules being promulgated yet. Uh, next slide, please. And in terms of next steps in the process, uh, I mentioned the rules. Um, we have um, not yet seen the rules. Um, uh, they have not been made available for public comment yet. Once they are published, there will be a 30-day a uh, public comment period. Um, given that today is November 30th, uh, you're looking at um, a either December 29th or December 30th um, final action on the rules and then a day to actually implement this. So 
um, another reason for us wanting to have a webinar like this um, so we can start, um, you can start thinking about how to um, align your business practices with this. Uh, there will be webinars and further guidance forthcoming in addition to the rules. Uh, we're expecting that December, the weeks of December 4th and December 11th. Um, I mentioned the notice in Keir. We are anticipating um, a, a trailer ordinance. Uh, we're hoping that it will be heard at the uh, December 7th uh, Workforce Development Committee. And um, we have been told that a, a notice in Keir is on the table for that. If you were following um, the uh, the final vote of passage, um, the uh, Alderman Riley had tried to um, put a floor amendment on the floor for a 30-day notice in Keir. Alderman Irvin had put forth uh, language around a seven-day notice in Keir. So those are kind of the parameters that we're working with here, um, but more to come on that front. And we've also um, heard that there might be a potential fix of the covered employee definition, but um, that is by no means uh, definitive yet. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention here, um, while this is happening to uh, Cook County, because they also have their own paid sick leave ordinance um, on the books, they did um, introduce an ordinance to revise their ordinance um, that would that would actually just mirror what the state is about to be doing. So five PTO days as the employee sees fit. The only significant difference is they are carrying over um, the private right of action provision from the existing Cook County ordinance. So um, though that's next steps in the immediate term. One point that I failed to mention earlier on the ordinance itself, um, what, what's in that chart is simply the floor. Um, and, and we'll get into with Ramiro um, here, kind of some of the, but any employer, um, a paid leave day is, is seen as a greater benefit than a paid sick leave day. So there are um, a lot of questions and we do expect further guidance to come in the rules about what, for instance, uh, if an employer decides to do 10 um, PTO days only, what that looks like, because that would be seen as a greater benefit than five paid sick leave days and five PTO days. Um, and I, in the rules, um, we're also expecting um, uh, some greater clarity around um, the process by which um, the employer can can track and notify their employees um, of of their of their paid leave benefits, whether it's online via a time clock, whether an app would suffice. Um, and then uh, I did mention I think we are hopeful that the, that the rules will clarify um, that an employer cannot be sued for an infraction that happens in 2024. Um, there's more to come, uh, and, and we'll blast out the rules to uh, all the attendees on this webinar as soon as we get them. Um, but with that, I am happy to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Ramiro Hernandez, who will be, uh, be doing a, a, a walk through the ordinance itself, and then we'll get into a Q&A from there. So again, thank you for your time today. Uh, thanks, Brad. Yeah, my name is Ramiro Hernandez. I'm a manager of government relations and public policy here at the Chamber. Uh, now that Brad kind of helped level set the conversation, provided us some quick background and overview of where things stand on the PTO ordinance, I wanted to give attendees a more in-depth look at some of the technical aspects of the ordinance. Um, the ordinance obviously uh, passed November 9th and had an effective date of December 31st, 2023. Obviously, that gives very little time for, for compliance even um, on, on those policies that, that may be above and beyond, right? Uh, what What is now being required by the city uh, of Chicago. Um, so let's uh, let's kind of dive right in. Uh, next slide, please. And I will note kind of like what Brad mentioned, unfortunately, until the rules drop, a lot of these case by case bases, obviously the ordinance provides some level of context, but not everything right for every industry and every employer. So we, we're going to have to uh, wait and see what what rules BACP kind of develops and see how some of these definitions, how some of these uh, other provisions would apply in, in certain case by case basis. So um, we, we will uh, follow up and, and, and uh, with all of you and provide some context as we learn it too, right? Because a lot of these things uh, we're just going off of what what is the letter of the law in the ordinance. Um, so uh, quickly, I wanted to uh, give uh, an overview of the first title scope and purpose section of the ordinance, which states that the ordinance shall be liberally construed in favor of providing Chicago workers with the greatest amount of paid leave or paid sick leave 
from work and employment security. Um, this is kind of a, a, a new provision that was not previously uh, in, in, the, in the city ordinance on paid sick leave. Uh, so again, this is like with everything, some things were, were grandfathered in from the previous uh, ordinance, some from the state law. Um, it was kind of a hybrid and then some new additional provisions uh, such as this one. So it, it, it again, uh, encourages all employers to uh, go through it with the fine tune comb and make sure that everything is, is squared away for your policies to be in compliance. Um, the first uh, major section of the ordinance deals with definitions. I encourage all employers, uh, compliance teams, legal teams to, to review them. So again, they will be in compliance. Um, the definitions are, are many, um, but some of the more important ones that impact employers would be covered employee, as Brad mentioned, for instance, uh, is defined as an employee who in any two week period performs at least two hours of work within the boundaries of the city of Chicago. This includes business travel. Um, it add, adds in domestic workers, uh, but it exempts public sector workers other than city of Chicago and sister city employees. Um, under the definition of employee, uh, later on construction workers, elected officials, contractors, and railroad workers are given explicit exemptions with the BACP given some rule making authority around uh, interns, city employed seasonal workers and OEM, OEMC traffic employees. Uh, and additionally, employer is defined as a person who gainfully employs at least one employee. Note there are no other guardrails or specific parameters around this definition. Employers need not necessarily be limited to Chicago employers if uh, their employees otherwise qualify. Um, and then lastly, two other key definitions are small and medium employer, which um, only necessarily impact the payout provisions as Brad kind of mentioned uh, earlier and we'll go a little bit deeper in uh, later on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, moving on, uh, we begin to outline the main requirements of uh, for employers to provide the paid leave. This section namely stipulates that paid leave and paid sick leave must be compensated at the same rate and with the same benefits that the employee regularly earns. Um, there is language provided concerning the calculation of wages for specific workers, but notably excludes from the equation uh, overtime, premium pay, uh, um, gratuities and commissions, which was kind of a big win during the negotiations. And then it also specifies that for tip workers specifically, uh, they need to be compensated uh, at at least the minimum wage level. Um, the ordinance also requires payment of uh, paid leave and paid sick leave no later than the payday for the next payroll period after the PTO was taken. Um, the section further prohibits employers from denying or modifying an employee's work hours or days to avoid providing him or her paid leave or paid sick leave and prohibits uh, absence control policies to negatively impact an employee status while using their paid leave. And lastly, uh, BACP rules will further um, outline some prohibitions on employers constructively discharging or terminating employers to, uh, employees to avoid offering this leave. Um, regarding the payout provision, the ordinance provides that accrued and unused paid leave must be paid out upon employment separation as opposed to paid sick leave, which has no payout requirement. Uh, however, for small employers, that is employers uh, under 50, they do not have to comply with this provision. And then for medium employers, that is employers with 51 to 100 employees, um, they are only required to pay out two days initially. And then beginning in uh, January of 2025, that, um, that two day payout goes away and they have to pay out again, the, the maximum uh, allowed for the year. Uh, some more technical provisions in the section include a requirement to ensure employers maintain medical coverage under any applicable group health plan, um, a requirement for paid sick leave accrued prior to January 1, 2024 uh, to be kind of rolled over into the following year, uh, prohibitions on employers from requiring employees to, as a condition of granting the paid leave, uh, to find a replacement worker, and then some language um, regarding um, allowing employees to keep their paid leave or paid sick leave in the event that the employer um, 
goes through a sale or transfer, otherwise the business uh, is handed off. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the following section uh, contains some of the most significant provisions of the ordinance. Uh, it outlines many of the technical requirements concerning the accrual method, number of days required to be offered, and other uh, policy requirements. One key provision of the ordinance states that if an employer has a policy that grants employees paid leave or paid sick leave in an amount and a manner that meets or exceeds the requirements of the ordinance, the employer needs to provide no additional paid leave or paid sick leave. Uh, during the negotiations, this was kind of like echoed to us that, you know, employers that meet or exceed the requirements of the, of the ordinance uh, need not change their policies. However, uh, given how there's several new provisions tacked on to what it means to provide, you know, uh, PTO under this ordinance, I, I would again encourage uh, employers to, to review uh, this language and possibly un and the rules BACP make gives us a little more clarity, but at, for the time being, um, again, uh, we want to ensure that employers are, are are taking their initiative to to review how this ordinance may impact their policies. And as stated before, uh, the ordinance mandates that covered employees begin to accrue leave benefits on day one of commencement of employment. However, the ordinance states that the actual use of the benefit need not be provided until 30 days of employment for paid sick leave and then 90 days uh, for the paid leave. Um, the leave must be allowed to be used, as Brad mentioned, in minimum increments of either four hours for the paid leave, PTO, or two hours in the case of paid sick leave. Um, the accrual of leave will be one to 35 hours. So for every 35 hours of work, you gain one hour of paid leave and one hour of paid sick leave. Um, however, that's obviously capped year, year round at five days for paid sick leave, five days for paid leave for a total of 10 days. There is also obviously the option of providing 10 PTO days, um, which as Brad mentioned, um, is, is considered a, a, a benefit uh, above a paid sick leave hour. So on the issue of rollover and carryover, the section provides that employers that do not front load paid leave, meaning that they do not make available the full 10 days uh, at the start of the 12 month period, no less than 16 hours or two days of paid leave and no less than 80 hours or 10 days of paid sick leave must be allowed to be rolled over. Um, again, for front loaded policies, uh, this rollover requirement does not apply. Um, the section contains explicit conditions uh, for paid leave and paid sick leave policies. For instance, in the case of paid leave policies, uh, as Brad mentioned, uh, requires that leave must be allowed for any reason of the employee's choosing. This means largely that no, no documentation or reason can be required as a condition of taking the leave. However, an employer is allowed to require employees to give reasonable notices of leave if the leave is expected, so no sooner than seven days, and require pre-approval of the employer if it means uh, maintaining continuity of employer operations. So that means different things for different industries, but uh, that provision is, get, again, product of neg negotiations to allow certain industries that, you know, can't have all of the workforce, you know, leave on certain high peak seasons. Um, so that, again, the rules are going to need to kind of like delve a little deeper in that and what that means. Um, Regarding paid sick leave policies, a lot of the requirements that were applicable now under the Chicago paid sick leave and minimum wage ordinance kind of applies. Uh, paid leave can only be taken for largely medical purposes. Uh, paid uh, sick leave um, can be taken uh, with only documentation required um, and a seven day notice. Um, after three consecutive days, there needs to be like a doctor's note or other legal requirements. And then it also allows an employer the ability to take adverse ap actions if the employee was indeed taking the paid sick leave for any other purpose other than uh, for medical care. Uh, the section also contains pretty strong language regarding compliance. The ordinance strictly states that no covered employer may deny an employee in a manner that practically prohibits the employee from ever utilizing his or her paid leave. 
However, in the event that the employee is prevented from taking any leave um, due to employer disapproval, this provides that such time must be permitted to be carried over the following year. Um, lastly, the section touches on some technical issues um, regarding uh, the employee ability to choose when to take the leave outside of any other local, state, or federal required leave. Um, and then um, it, it, it has some language regarding a limited PTO, although in large part, all of the provisions still apply even under an unlimited PTO model. Next slide, please. Uh, lastly, kind of some of the other technical provisions of interest, uh, union contracts, which uh, Brad touched on, uh, unless it's construction work, which is explicitly exempted, uh, CBAs are grandfathered in, but in the event that after January 1, 2024, there's another CBA entered into that the rights under the ordinance need to be waived, so agreed under the CBA. Um, there are notice and posting requirements in the ordinance. So it charges BACP with uh, providing templates and some of these notices that will have to be going up at the workplace and provided to employees. Um, and then it has some restrictions concerning any changes in policies that have to be provided to, to the employees ahead of time. Uh, regarding record retention, uh, employers are largely going to be uh, subject to this five-year record retention requirement unless there is an ongoing claim, action, or investigation. Um, and then there's some new language regarding a re rebuttable presumption of a violation occurring if an employer fails to meet this requirement, just something to, to keep in mind. Um, lastly, there's a section concerning administrative penalties and legal exposure for an employer with an existing paid sick leave policy that fails to comply with the new ordinance or transition employee benefits. Um, and then lastly, I know Brad mentioned quite a bit on the penalties and, and uh, private right of action. BACP is given uh, rather broad powers for investigations. They're charged with adopting rules and regulations as we've mentioned. Um, and then the department is allowed to impose fines on employers of $1,000 for a first offense and $3,000 for each separate violation of the ordinance. On the notice and posting violations, which are more minor infractions, there are lower fines of $500 to $1,000. Um, regarding possible litigation, uh, the new ordinance states that any employer who violates the ordinance or any rule related to the ordinance is liable to the employee for damages equal to three times the full amount of any leave denied or lost, plus interest at prevailing rate, plus costs and reasonable attorney's fees. Additionally, and this was a huge sticking point during the negotiation process, uh, the ordinance has some broad language concerning private causes of action or private rights of action. Specifically, the ordinance states that if an employee is denied a benefit protected under the ordinance, the employee is able to recover and a civil action damages equal to uh, three times the full amount of leave lost or denied due to the violation, plus the interest and the amount of the prevailing rate, plus reasonable attorney's fees. Um, for paid sick leave, the private right of action um, is available starting 12-31-2023. Uh, however, for the new PTO or paid leave provisions under the ordinance, um, there was some gesture of good faith, although it was did not go as far as we needed it to. The private uh, cause of action will not be available until January 1, 2025. However, we should note that this is more so a delay in action than it is kind of a moratorium on action. So even though um, advocates and, and, and proponents of legislation offer this as, as kind of a win for employers, um, they should nevertheless very carefully read that provision as it pertains to legal exposure. But I know that was a lot, and I'll kind of stop there. Um, and I know we have a Q&A coming up um, with Brad and myself. So, and we can start with some questions. Great, and um, thank you, Ramiro. And um, I'm sure uh, the questions, we're, we're, we're coming in as you were speaking, Ramiro, so uh, take a look. But I was um, 
reviewing. And um, there were a number of questions related to uh, vacation time. And I wanted to um, make this clarification. So under the Wage Payment and Collection Act, an employer has the option um, to offer uh, vacation days. And uh, some, of the, some of the questions noted that under the Wage Payment Collection Act, uh, payout is required. Uh, for vacation days when an employee is separated from employment. So that is that is true. Um, however, the, the uh, Paid Leave for All Workers Act at the state level explicitly um, prohibits payout. And uh, the distinction there is under the Wage Payment and Collection Act, um, the vacation days are being offered by an employer as an option. Whereas under the, um, uh, the Paid Leave for All Workers Act, it is a, it is a, it is a mandate. Um, so that is that is an important distinction that we were having. So and that does dovetail into what some other um, questions we're getting at. So if you, for instance, have um, if, if you offer vacation time um, and you were to pivot those days to to PTO time, uh, that might have an effect on um, what, you, what what that means for um, for payout, for instance. So. Um, you know, we're happy to, to kind of get into that more. Another question that um, did come in, we have less than 15 employees. We do not have hourly employees and don't currently keep timesheets as everyone is salaried. Is there a carve out for exempt versus not exempt employees? Uh, the answer to that is there is not. Um, so, you know, and particularly for payout purposes, uh, if you are subject to that, there is gonna have to be um, some level of, of tracking now. Um, and also, you know, the definition of covered employee, because if that person, uh, you know, maybe spends a lot of their time in the suburbs, but they travel to the city now, uh, you as the employer and that employee now are subject to this new uh, ordinance. Uh, another question, how much detail needs to be included in the five day advance notice required for employers uh, to give staff regarding the new policies? Uh, is there a standard template? Uh, we hope and we've been told this will be addressed in rule. Um, but outside of that, we have not seen um, further guidance yet. Um, do you know the definition of day? Um, so this applies to a worker, uh, which based on a, a, a 40 hour, eight hour work day, 40 hour work week. Um, but for instance, part time workers, though, while they will not have to be, um, you know, meet the full the full five and five or 10 days, uh, the accrual rate is going to be what matters um, for, for part time workers. Um, another question. So if an hourly employee requests time off, sick or PTO, how many hours do we have to give them um, for a shift? Do we take their average? Uh, for example, our restaurant employees do not uh, set shift times and they vary. How do we best determine how many hours to give them? And uh, all, all we can say, is, you know, um, on this is the floor is uh, two hour increment for paid sick leave and, and uh, four. So uh, the worker cannot, um, they cannot take, for instance, uh, two hours of PTO. It has to be at least uh, four hours. Um, and then, so yeah, we got past the, the wage payment and um, collection part. Another question, can you please explain the seven days, 56 hour payout for PTO again? Um, you mentioned this would uh, be if you carry over the two days, but then front load, I thought if you front load PTO, you don't have to carry over. And that is correct. Um, the scenario that which we're presenting is probably the most um, uh, extreme, if you will. And, and that would be if an employer um, does not uh, front load in one year, but then the next year decides to front load. But um, the, the most number of days that employee can have on the PTO side available to them at any time is, is seven days. And that would be, again, in a scenario where um, the employer does not front load in year one, for instance, and then the, uh, the benefit year turns over and they decide to front load um, for that time. Um, another question, is there a max for sick time rollover? Uh, and the answer to that question is yes, so only 10 days, uh, well, I shouldn't say only, but, but 10 paid sick leave days uh, can, uh, can be rolled over. Uh, and that would be, and then if the worker, um, they accrue, uh, their five sick leave days. So the most they could have at any given time is, is 15 days. Um, so we're starting to review. Ramiro, are there any questions that you're seeing come in that you want to take? Well, I, a lot are coming through right now. 
Uh, yeah, definitely. I can touch on a couple that I've been uh, going through and uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of good questions. Unfortunately, uh, we, we can only speak to what's in the ordinance, right? So there, there are some questions about uh, existing policies where uh, PTO sick leave policies are already in place that might meet or exceed kind of the days. Um, it's, it's hard to say uh, right now definitively whether BACP is going to, you know, say like, okay, you're good as long as, let's say you offer 15 days, but um, on, on the accrual or payout or carryover, like your policy is, is, is less than the benefit that, that would be required under this new ordinance. Um, it's, it's tough to say definitively whether there's going to be any change in the ordinance. And unfortunately, I don't think until we see some rules from the department will we kind of glean some uh, some information to definitely say uh, if, if any policies need to be changed. Um, as far as there's another question, will you please elaborate on the rollover required for sick leave into 2024? There are some provisions in there just stating that to the extent that there is paid leave, paid sick time accrued um, and unused during uh, the 2023 year, right? So things that are already re required under the Chicago paid sick leave ordinance, now these days will have to be uh, rolled over uh, or allowed to be rolled over under the new parameters into the following year. And, this, and the same uh, rollover cap on paid sick leave applies here. Um, how do we uh, handle the paid sick leave separation payout rules in light of the IWPCA rules requiring it? Uh, this one, uh, unfortunately, we're going to need a little more guidance from the BACP. Um, and then another question here regarding the doctor's note uh, that we have to require after three sick days. Should we be verifying that doctor's note? We've had uh, staff forge doctor's notes in the past. What are others doing here? Um, this one, again, um, it should be the, the paid sick time provisions uh, outside of some of the accrual, which are greater than the existing ordinance, um, still apply. So on the doctor's note, whatever has been done for purposes of verification and requiring this documentation, um, uh, the same rules would, would apply. But but BA, BACP might might have some more information once they adopt these rules. There's another question, and um, this has been an interesting one. And actually, uh, the the city is still is still thinking through this as well, and we know this. But the the act seems to allow employers to wait. 30 days uh, for sick time and 90 days for paid leave for an employee's initial use. If an employer front loads vacation sick time, can they still not allow usage until 30, 90 days? Uh, we are hoping that that will be uh, addressed in the rules because um, under, under the current language, if, if an employer front loads all the time and an employee has been with an employer for more than 30 or 90 days, uh, yes, they, they would have access, uh, as we read it, uh, to those days uh, immediately. And I can say that's not how um, the city was, was thinking about it. They thought they had until uh, at least April 1. Um, so that, that we're hoping for, for more clarification uh, there. Another um, a question, has the city provided any explanation for the public employee exemptions? Uh, they have not. Um, other than, you know, there are collective bargaining agreements in place. Uh, OEMC has unique uh, challenges for why they would be exempt. But uh, you're seeing this at the city. You're also seeing this at the state level where um, municipal governments are, are trying to get a carve out from the state law as well, um, which uh, has just been curious uh, to us is what I would is what I would say. And we've had a number of uh, just, I think, philosophical challenges with that. Um, and then and another question, do we need to worry about Cook County? Is the rollover on paid leave more generous than Chicago? Uh, I briefly mentioned Cook County earlier. Uh, that ordinance uh, was introduced at the end of October. It was scheduled for a hearing. It passed committee actually in November, but it did not advance on the final um, Board of Commissioners floor yet. 
um, but we're hopeful that'll pass soon. Um, but what was what passed committee, um, with the exception of the private right of action and a few minor other uh, details, um, simply complied with what the state is doing. So uh, five PTO days and accrual rate of one hour for every 40 hours worked. Um, is there a required time frame for BACP to get this information out? Uh, there is not, according to the language, um, but we keep being told uh, to expect the rules to come here uh, shortly. Uh, however, we have yet to see those rules. So um, more to come on that. Ramiro, are there any others that you've seen come through that? I want to make sure we're answering as many as possible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I know we're running uh, a little against the clock, but we'll try to move as quickly as possible through many of these. Um, uh, can you please explain the language regarding uh, use of uh, paid time off or paid sick leave prior to other employee leaves? Uh, there is language in the ordinance that allows for employees to choose when they take the leave ahead or after any state or federal protected leave. Um, does this prohibit employers from combining uh, PTO and paid sick uh, with current leave banks. Again, employers are given the option uh, to choose whether they opt for a flat 10 PTO day model or a five and five. So five paid sick, five uh, paid leave. Um, and, and we are, to Ramiro's point on that, we are expecting, we're hoping that that'll be clarified in rule, but like a, a question you might you might ask. So if you want to offer 10 days of just PTO time, um, can you apply? Can that um, can those only be subject to employer to full employer pre approval, for instance? Um, is that a lesser or greater benefit than what is being set by this new floor? And those questions are still unanswered. But or is even, you know, maybe if you notch it up and you say we'll do uh, 12 PTO days. Uh, and it's full employer pre-approval because you're not offering some um, ability for the employee to take the time um, as needed, you know, like wake up or whatever and call off. Um, that that those questions are still um, not uh, or are still unclear to us. Um, but so like you know, I, again, we wanted to um, bring this group together to kind of start, you know, to to give what we're hearing and what we've been you know talking about, but also to let you know that some of these questions remain unanswered and will require further guidance. There, uh, there's another question here. Sorry if I missed this, but is there a threshold for the number of employees or number of hours they work each week? Um, again, the ordinance is pretty broad. Uh, all private employers, except those that have ex explicit exemptions, which are limited to uh, those in the construction industry, rail, um, and then CBAs, again, if the CBA agrees to waive the, the protections under the ordinance, um, all of these employees would, would, would be subject to it. And again, looking at the definitions, um, business travel, other forms of, of, of employees would, would easily hit that covered employee uh, definition. And then employer merely states a person who gainfully employs at least one employee uh, with no other guard, guardrails. So. We take there's that another, to a broad interpretation. There's another question here to for further explanation on the private right of action. Um, again, what what's on paper uh, says that um, a um, the private right of action cannot be utilized against an employer um, uh, until January one of 2025. However, it's it's um, it's it's lacking significant clarity where um, many believe that. Um, an employer could be sued for an infraction that occurs in 2024, um, but that lawsuit just cannot occur until January 1 of 2025. Um, another question we got here, we've gotten a couple like this um, related to uh, employees um, or employers that have employees in both uh, the city and outside of the city. Uh, could employers have a policy for employees to accrue under Chicago for only the time in Chicago? Um, and Again, the you know the definition of covered employee um, is is so expansive. Uh, if a worker works two hours in a two week period uh, in the city, technically uh, this ordinance would would apply to them. Um, so I, I think uh, employers are going to have to keep um, do some really good record keeping on uh, employees um, who work primarily in Cook County or outside of the city, and then those who work in the city. 
Um, and I've seen a couple of questions come through again on the unlimited PTO. And I just wanted to clarify because um, a lot of companies now are moving towards an unlimited PTO model because um, they want to uh, attract and retain uh, the top talent. Um, but under this now, you will have to track because in, in the eyes of the ordinance, unlimited PTO is, it, is viewed as front loading uh, at least five PTO days. Um, so if the employee leaves during that benefit year, and maybe they've taken two, but not used all their five days, um, that employee now uh, will have to look, is owed um, payout for three days. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of <laughs> um, how, how complicated some of this is and uh, how not well thought out a lot of it is as well. Ramiro, we got three minutes here. Are there any other questions that you've come that you've seen come through? Yeah, just quickly some clarification questions on the CBA. Um, as we mentioned, all CBAs would kind of be grandfathered. So if they're in effect before this January 1, 2024, uh, they, they will not be impaired by the ordinance. However, any agreement that's entered into uh, post the new year, um, the ordinance may apply, but the CBA is allowed to waive, obviously, uh, the protections under, under the ordinance. Uh, does the ordinance require companies to know to now pay out uh, vacation personal leave? Uh, if Again, if the PTO days are protected under the ordinance, uh, notwithstanding the small medium business exemption, so like for small businesses, the payout doesn't apply in medium businesses, it's two days and then eventually uh, up to the max, uh, the PTO provisions must be uh, allowed to the employees. Regarding medical coverage, should that be through the employer's health insurance provider? Yeah, so the medical coverage language would essentially state that, you know, if the employee is allowed to be uh, given the medical uh, leave benefits, then those benefits are protected during that leave, right? Um, great, great. Well, I know we got uh, one minute left here and we've got a whole lot more questions that have come through. What we will do is um, is log all these questions and um, to on, on most of these, we we have some level of um, of an answer. On some, unfortunately, we won't until more rules are are provided. But uh, we'll do our best to answer all these questions and get this back and get these out um, to the attendees of this webinar. Um, again, this webinar um, has been recorded and it will be live on our website. And we will also be sharing um, the slides uh, that were presented today as well. So. Uh, we do want to uh, thank you again, uh, like Jack said at the onset of uh, many of the members, many who are on the call today uh, were extremely helpful um, in providing us feedback and calling aldermen, uh, what have you. And we really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you again for joining us today and uh, more to come. And as soon as the rules come out, we'll blast those out to these attendees as well. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, thank you again for joining us.